Hello people, it's Gino here from realeverydayenglish.com. Welcome back to the channel. Today I have a very special guest on the channel. I have Joanne, who is a fellow English teacher with a lot more experience than me. And she's also from Manchester as well. Um, she's actually from central Manchester. I'm from greater Manchester. So very interesting talk we've got for you today. Joanne, hello and how are you? Hello Gino, thank you for inviting me. I'm really good, thanks. How are you? I'm really good, yeah. Thank you for coming on the channel. I know it's not um, it's not too easy to come on camera and uh, appear on YouTube. I keep trying to blag loads of my mates into coming on, but they're just not having it. <laughs> I've managed yeah. to... Uh, sorry, what was you going to say? I was going to say, um, I think some of my students will be very excited because when I introduced your channel to them a few months ago, They've all subscribed and they're all coming into class telling me all these new words that they've learned from Gino. So <laughs> I think it's very excited to see their own teacher on YouTube. That's that's brilliant. Uh, it, it's amazing to hear that because um, I don't know if I've told you, but I don't have any classroom teaching experience with English. I only have experience of teaching my language partners. So I've got plenty of hands on experience of helping people learn, but I've never I've never taught in a classroom. So it's good to hear that. And um, I should imagine they're learning the kind of words that will actually be useful for them as well, especially if they're here uh, in this area, Northern England, because our accents do tend to fluctuate a little bit. I think one of the bonuses for them was they asked me to find them um, somebody that speaks English from the local area, but they never expected it to be somebody that was going to teach them words as well. So the reason that they were following your channel was to get used to your a different accent because obviously the kind of lessons that I teach is a little bit textbook because they're aiming towards passing an exam so there's a lot of yeah, formal yeah. language that we teach they've got to be able to write formal emails and take part in job interviews so we don't really focus as much on the everyday language and when I found your channel I just thought oh I'll give it a go in the classroom and see if they can understand you and they understood everything that you said but the wow. great thing is, not only can they understand what you say, they're actually picking up phrases that are very useful to them. So that's been a big bonus. Yeah, definitely. I think I, I think both both scenarios are useful. So I think it's it's incredibly useful to learn formal English, um, grammatically correct English. Because I always tell one of my friends, he's actually appeared on the channel a few times, Rodrigo from uh, Rodrigo, the Brazilian English teacher, and. Uh, he, I always tell him when I'm texting him, listen, mate, don't copy my English. <laughs> don't don't copy my, my text messages because I just miss words out and, and all this and all this great stuff. But I, it, there's, there's a need for both. So if somebody's, yeah. um, like you said, got the goal of passing an exam or they want to get a job in English, they'll be writing lots of formal emails, then there's definitely a need to learn the correct grammatical um, formal English, let's say, rather than the slang English or the street English. Uh, so, yeah, there's a need for both. So, uh, fellow Mancunian, uh, which area in Manchester are you from? Do you want to tell uh, my audience? I was born in Gorton. So you're born in Gorton, so you're right in the central area of right. Manchester there, aren't you? Yeah. So, yeah, the, the accent there is actually quite different to mine because I'm, I'm greater Manchester. I'm in Wigan. So there's, there's a big difference between the, the accents, isn't there? Definitely. I think I've lost a little bit of my accent over the years because I've, I can say I've been teaching for almost 20 years now. And I think because I've always taught English as a second language, I kind of adapt my language a little bit so that people can understand me more. And I have to sometimes stop myself and think, no, I'm not in the classroom. Go back to being Joanne. <laughs> <It's different laughs> so I don't know. H how do you think my accent is? Do you think I sound like a typical monk or... No, I, I can tell you from Manchester, but it's um, <clears throat> it's not as strong Mancunian uh, as I would expect uh, from Garton. But like you say, that's probably just because um, you are used to teaching English, and also you've got experience in learning languages yourself. And I think I think when when you have that experience of knowing what it's like trying to understand what somebody's saying when they're speaking really fast, I think you you tend to realise then that you need to slow down when you're talking to um, non-native speakers especially those who are just in the beginning of learning the language so i think i think you're probably right yeah and the, the, 
um, the people that I'm teaching are um, all different levels. So we've got people that have just literally moved to the UK with virtually no English at all. We've got people who they, they, they can't write um, sentences in English. So we, we've got absolute beginners and then up to people who are kind of aiming to go to university and study in the UK. There's a huge range of people that I'm teaching. So again, I, in the morning, I might be teaching a class of people who are learning to say, um, I like apples, I don't like bananas. And then in the afternoon, I'm teaching kind of pre-GCSE level. So again, it's all about adapting your language for the audience, really. Yeah, definitely. I should imagine that's that's quite um, quite a fulfilling role because I should imagine you get to see them go through the the process of not being able to speak properly, not being able to write, and then going through the process of learning to speak, learning to write, and ultimately um, getting better life opportunities here in the UK because of that. So it must be quite a rewarding role for you. It is, yeah, and I think the most rewarding things are the things that you don't think about. So it's when a student comes to me and says, I don't need an interpreter anymore. I can go to the doctors and I can tell them my problems myself. And we don't think about that, do we? You know, it's quite personal when you go to see your, job, your doctor. You don't necessarily want to go through an interpreter. So knowing that they're able to do that by themselves, I just feel quite empowered that I've motivated people and that is the job satisfaction, as you say, seeing people improve their lives greatly and then going on to get a job or going on to study or just being able to go to Asda and buy something without relying on somebody helping them. So yeah, it is an extremely rewarding job. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd never thought of it from that angle because it, it must be pretty um, invasive if you can't, if you can't communicate um, what your personal health problems are to someone, for example. You don't, you don't want everybody knowing your health problems, do you? No. So, wow, that's, that's, that's an amazing role you're playing there, an amazing... Um, it must feel good to, to get people to, towards the goals, is what Definitely. I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, I enjoy it. Yeah, I can imagine. So, gr growing up in Manchester, Garton, uh, what, what was that like? What were your experiences? And um, what kind of things did you like to do? Foods, foods you like to eat that don't exist anymore? Uh, <laughs> things like that. I think one of my best memories of growing up in Gorton was I lived in a terraced house, your typical row of terraces, and we all used to keep our doors open because we all knew each other. Yeah. And especially the summer holidays were great. I remember we used to put a blanket in front of our house, me and my sister Julie, we'd get our orange juice and our biscuits and we'd sit on the floor and then the neighbours' kids would come along and then we'd all go into each other's houses. Um, and then there was like a little area that we were allowed, don't go past that road and don't go past that road. <laughs> We'd be down the back entry on our bikes. And obviously in those days, there wasn't as many, there weren't as many cars on the road. So um, we could just have fun on bikes and scooters playing out. And then it'd get to seven o'clock and then our mum would be shouting, it was time to come home. And then we'd dash, we'd hide. <laughs> that sounds very... That, that, my best childhood memories, playing out with my friends. Yeah, that, that sounds very familiar, that. <laughs> the dashing bit when your mum's trying to shout you. Yeah. Especially you know, on a Sunday night because you knew you had to have your hair washed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. I hated that part. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I actually live in a terrace now. I, I live in an end terrace. So mine's okay. the, the, the terrace on the end, the gable end, and then we've got uh, what we would call a ginnel. We've got a ginnel at the side and a ginnel going across the back. It's like bin runs. Yeah, I think the word ginnel because we used to call it the entry do we use that word anymore the back entry yeah so there's the you'll hear people it's alley, isn't it? back alley yeah yeah so here you've got i think the main word i hear uh, around here is is the word alley so they'll say the the alleys are the back alley uh, people do use ginnel uh, they also use entry as well so in the entry um but here's here's a game did, did you used to play kirby as a kid no. No, you, you might you might have called it something different there in Garton. It's when you've got um, it's when you've got a football, and you stand on opposite ends of the road, and you have to throw the ball so that it bounces back to you off the curb on the opposite side of the road. Oh, didn't don't know. No, no. no. Yeah. Hide and seek. That was a good one. We used yeah. to play hide and seek, and hopscotch was another one. Yeah. Jacking in the road, yeah. Um, 
We used to play. We used to play bulldog in the in the school playground, which was like um, you had you had to get from one side of the playground to the other, and there was a team in the middle who had to tick you and stop you from getting over there. Uh, and if you got ticked, you were out. I don't know what, what you used to call that or if you used to play it at all. Or was that a boys thing, maybe? It was. We used to play, um, what time is it, Mr Wolf? Mm. You have to creep to the front or something. I remember that one in primary school. And yeah. then another one, come downstairs without laughing. I remember that one. And no, that's a... Playground, running around the um, tennis court where it was painted on. And you'd run around and play Pac-Man and catch people and then you were out. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. I remember the sports days as well. Do you remember the oh, sports days? You used to have yes. <laughs> Did you used to put your thumb on? <laughs> I, I wasn't so subtle. I just used to put my hand on it and sprint oh. <laughs> and then get disqualified. Did you actually have eggs or potatoes for the egg and spoon race? They were like little, little, um, from what I remember, they were like little plastic balls, but they were solid. They weren't actual eggs, I don't think. But it was called the Egg and Spoon Race. Yeah, it was called the Egg and Spoon Race. I think yeah. we had potatoes for the Egg and... And then there was the Sack Race. Do you remember the Sack Race? Yeah, I remember that, yeah. You had to jump, didn't you? Like a... Yeah. Almost like a rabbit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Good times. <laughs> Good times. I think I think some of, the, um, some of the equipment we used to use in PE, in primary schools, I don't think they use it anymore. Do you, we used to use them... They were like blocks that stacked on top of each other. Do you remember them? And yeah. used to have to climb on top. They were like cushioned on top. Yeah. Yeah, we used to use uh, them quite a lot. Like hula hoops. Do you remember hula hoops? Yeah, I do. I could never do it, and I still can't do it now. No. <laughs> bean bags. I remember little bean bags for like rally, like a rally race or something. Yeah. Yeah, you used to throw them at each other. It was like, um, I think the Americans call it dodgeball, don't they? But I don't know what we call it. But we used to throw them at each other, and if you got hit, then you was out. <clears throat> good times, good times. So, what, what kind what of what food you were going to say? Sorry. Yeah, that's another thing. Yeah. Um, can you remember any specific foods that were around back then? I remember going to the chippy for a chip bomb. Can't beat it. <laughs> no. Chip bomb and iced fingers from the bakers. Yeah, they, they still do them. That is basically just bread with icing on it, isn't it? Bread with icing, yeah. <laughs> but it was great as a kid for some reason. Now I, I, I'd be like, why am I eating bread with icing on it? <laughs> and then you've got a bit of butter in the middle for some strange reason. Yeah. Do... It wasn't very exciting, the food that I had as a kid. It was all very like Finder's crispy pancakes and fish fingers, chips and beans. And then yeah. the traditional Sunday roast meat and three veg, Yorkshire puddings, roast chicken. So very traditional, but not very adventurous food. Yeah, much, much the same, much the same in, in our household as well. During the week, it was, it was very quick, done food, because both my mum and dad were working. So, uh, but religiously, every Sunday, Sunday roast. Can't beat it. The best English dish you've got. What about what music? After your Sunday dinner. Ooh, I, I used to like jam roly poly and custard. Yeah. Yeah. Or um, apple crumble with custard or Arctic roll. Living the dream, Arctic roll. I've not had that for years. That's the ice cream, isn't it? With the, yeah. with the sponge around the outside. Wow. I don't even know if they sell them anymore. I'd, I've not seen one for years. They must sell that. That is, that is the, food of, the food of gods. <laughs> yeah, as far as I'm concerned. So what kind of music did you used to listen to when you were younger? Uh, or even um, now? When I was younger, I used to listen to Wham. Oh, okay. And um, Madonna, George Michael, which is obviously Wham. Um, yeah, that, Top of the Pops, anything that was on Top of the Pops. Yeah. My friend Rodrigo, he absolutely loves Madonna. And he sent me a video of his, it actually features on my channel. We did a video and he showed the inside of his, um, of his uh, English school there in Brazil. And he's got a massive picture of Madonna on the wall because he, he really likes her. Madonna now. I can't say I do, but she, she is good. <laughs> she made some good music. Definitely. Definitely. So 
In terms of teaching English, uh, how did you get started in that? Was that something you've done from, did you go to through college, university, or did you start later? Or? Well, it was kind of, um, I went to university and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I picked the wrong subject, as people often do. And then halfway through, I decided that um, I really wanted to do English, because I'd done English at college, and for some reason I didn't pick it. So I ended up going abroad every year on holiday. My dad used to take me to um, Portugal, Spain, Turkey, Greece. And somewhere I thought, you know, it would be quite nice to be able to have an extended holiday and perhaps teach English. So I managed to change my degree and I started studying politics and English at uni. And then when I'd finished, I did a TEFL course. And I just thought, well, I'll give it a go and see how it goes. And then I moved to Turkey and I taught in Turkey for a couple of years. And wow. that's picking up the language. And yeah. So my first teaching years were in a foreign country where I couldn't really speak the language. And I didn't really expect that this was my life career. It was just an opportunity to spend a little bit more time in a hot country. Yeah, um, yeah. And to be fair, I... I enjoyed it, but not that much. So I came back to England after a couple of years and I didn't teach for about three or four years. I worked for Turkish Airlines. And then something in the back of my head was niggling me saying, no, no, get back into teaching. And that's when I started teaching here in the UK, okay. which is ESOL as opposed to EFL. Mm -hmm. And if I look back, I've just loved it. I've just really enjoyed it and then I did a PGCE about 10 years ago um, and I've, I do a lot of examining work as well so it kind of happened by accident but I'm glad yeah, I did, yeah. if that makes that's, sense. Yeah definitely that's super interesting it's super interesting that my brother he had a, a similar experience he he did a law degree um, and then he ended up getting a job in a solicitors and I think he was he was sitting behind this desk all day dealing with um dealing with people's problems and, and and stuff like this and he i think he just thought there must be more to life than this so he with with a degree and if you get a tfl like you like you did yourself uh you can then go and teach around the world can't you so he he went and taught in china uh for around six years he's only just returned actually he's just returned wow. due to all the, the covid and everything going on what what did you do what did you do for the airlines was you um urged you with s or was you behind the scenes I was ground staff at um, Manchester Airport, so doing ticket sales reservation and helping with checking. Wow, good. And then I, I, I should imagine you got to practice your Turkish a lot then as well, didn't you? I did, yeah. People yeah. were quite surprised. They, they don't expect that somebody from Manchester can speak Turkish, but it was very useful. Um, I went on and did an A-level in Turkish because I thought, well, I'm not wasting all this language use. And it was then that I started... Um, working weekends with the local Bangladeshi community where I lived in, Man in I was living in Hyde at the time. Okay, yeah. And there was a job advertised helping children in primary school boost their English and their maths. So that was like how I managed to get back into teaching after sort of three or four years of not, of not teaching. And then it was from that job that I applied and started teaching adults. So since yeah. then I've been working in adult education in Manchester. Yeah, I should, I should imagine working working at Manchester Airport on an airline. Um, I should imagine it's a good job that because when people are travelling, they tend to be happy, don't they? So you do, everybody you, said that it's a really happy environment. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine it beats, for example, sitting behind a desk typing all day, doesn't it? You know, um, like your your standard yeah, nine to five. Yeah. So are you. Yeah, so you so you managed to to um, get yourself to a high level in the Turkish language. Uh, what 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 tips or what um, methods did you find useful? Obviously, he was living in the country, so it was sink sink or swim, I should imagine. It was, and it was. I think the way that I because I studied college. At, sorry, I studied college. I studied French at high school, and then I went on to to do A level at college. Okay. And it was a totally different experience learning French at college in the UK than going to Turkey and learning the language organically, I should say. It was yeah, kind yeah. of like 
I was just absorbed. I, everywhere I went, I could see, I could hear, I could feel the language. And for quite a long time, I didn't speak. I was just like a sponge. And it was just coming. And then now and again, I'd hear a word repeated. And then I'd ask, what does that word mean? Or mm. what does that phrase mean? And then patterns started to emerge. And that's kind of when eventually I felt confident to actually use some of the language. So I think being in the environment where the language is used is by far the best way to learn a language. And that's why now um, a lot of my students um, don't use English at home. Their husbands or their wives or their children speak in their own language. Mm. So what I always do is I encourage them to either watch TV in English or listen to the radio um, and just absorb yourself as much in, in the language. And that, that for me is the best thing. Listen yeah. to music in English, is, you know, anything really. Yeah, definitely. I I a hundred percent agree with that. Immersion is the is the way forward. Um you can if if you don't live in the country, you can do certain things like try and watch more telly, as you said, in, in the language that you're trying to learn. Set your phone to the language that you your target language, things like that. But um I notice that if, if I travel if I travel somewhere, if I travel to a Spanish speaking country and spend five, six days just speaking solely Spanish, then when I come home my language exchanges just feel like it's like going, it's like running a marathon and then going for a jog for a mile the week after it's, um, I just find it really easy. I hope in the, in the future, I get to spend more time uh, in, cause I think that's what I need to take me, to take my level from where it's at, which is conversational right up to the, to the, to the highest level you can get to really. Cause that's my goal. That's where I want to be. Definitely. So thank you for appearing on the channel. It's been lovely to have you. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, it's a pleasure, as always. Okay, so we'll finish there. We'll say goodbye to the audience and then uh, we'll have a quick chat afterwards, okay? Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.